thanks Johannes for the kind introduction and thanks for the, to the organizers for putting together this conference. The title is Pseudo Majoranas for Quantum Spin Simulation. So in that talk I want to take you to the land of frustrated quantum magnetism and the attraction in this land is complicated looking um, materials where yeah, the low energy degrees of freedom are localized spins sitting here in the center or in the corners of this yeah, crystal structure. And frustration refers to the fact that in, if you have antiferromagnetic coupling on certain geometries like the triangle here, um, you can put two spins and make that bond happy, but the third spin here doesn't know if to, put, uh, if to point downstairs or, or upstairs. Um, one of the bonds will always be unhappy, so this is a frustrated system or a frustrated lattice. And if you have sufficient degree of frustration, you can find quantum phases, usually at low temperature, um, that refuse to order magnetically, but instead form what is known as a quantum spin liquid that has a large degree of entanglement and is assumed to play uh, an important role in future uh, quantum information technology. Sometimes the frustration is not quite strong enough and instead you form something like a quantum paramagnet, here a valence bond crystal, where you pair um, neighboring spins in a singlet and you break translational invariance in that way. Or even um, less spectacular, um, the system can order magnetically. Yeah. And the question is, of course, what of these yeah, different choices are, are realized at a given temperature, magnetic field or pressure, and this is what our experimental friends um, pursue in the lab every day, but it's also a formidable challenge for the theory uh, community. So there we typically write down model Hamiltonians here, spin one Heisenberg systems, and in this talk I will focus on, on spin, one spin one half exclusively, and the question is, so given, given, a, given a lattice, given a coupling, uh, coupling constants, what is, the, what is the phase diagram? And unfortunately, the, you can do very little analytically in an exact fashion. Um, so the, it's the, the main workhorse here is numerical methods, and there is not a single numerical method that you can take out of the box, and that always works. So each method has a certain set of shortcomings. For example, exact organization only usually works for small systems. High temperature expansion, as the name says, you're limited to temperatures usually above uh, the coupling constant J. The DMRG, density matrix organization group, is great for 1D. It now works also for 2D, but in 3, 3D it's still very challenging to apply. Quantum Monte Carlo is, um, works in all dimensions, but only for certain Hamiltonians that don't have a sign problem. So what I want to talk about in this uh, few minutes here are diagrammatic approaches. This is one of the methods that you learn pretty, pretty early on in your physics. Uh, physics program in the in in the um, disguise of perturbation theory, but I also want to consider non-perturbative extensions of uh, of this diagrammatic perturbation theory, like the functional renormalization group FRG or Parquet um, Parquet equations. And the catch here is that usually we apply these diagrammatic approaches for fermionic systems that are characterized by this quite simple anti-commutation relations, and also for bosonic systems. But um, so what prevents us from applying this method straightforwardly for spin system is this um, spin, um, spin algebra that is shown here, and the alpha and beta stands for x, y, or z component of spin. Good, so if we still want to apply our fermionic methodology, diagrammatic methodology, uh, our first task is to go from spins to fermions. So in that, to do that, we introduce so-called pseudo-fermions, F, they come with spin up and spin down. To, uh, taken together with, the, with this Pauli matrix, we can try to represent the spin operator like that. So um, if you now take this definition and insert it here in the, in the, in the um, spin algebra, you see that there is some tension. Yeah? The second term is perfectly reproduced, but the first term, there is a prefactor here um, that includes this D. So what is the D? The D is a, um, known as the local fermion parity. This is the formal definition here, and it's a constant of motion. So the D takes on the value of plus one in the subspace where only one um, fermion is present at the spin site, and then the, 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 fermion, the, the spin algebra is perfectly fulfilled. And if it takes on this uh, minus one, so this happens if the site is empty, no F fermion present, or if both F fermions are present, then the spin algebra is not fulfilled. 
So it, we say this is not a faithful representation yeah, because it depends on the, on the local uh, fermion parity. So does that matter for practical simulations? Here is a case study of a simple Heisenberg dimer, just two spins coupled antiferminetically, and if we diagonalize that system, first rewritten in terms of the F fermions, we see yeah, there is the, the singlet ground state and the triplet state, and there is another state appearing yeah, due to this um, fermion representation at zero energy. And that is the state that has, has the minus one eigenvalue for D, or it's a degenerate state. So this, these states with D minus one appear at unphysical energies, and if you're now working with a method that works in the canonical ensemble, this is a problem because this, this extra state here spoils your thermodynamic observables here, the internal energy versus temperature, yeah, where, where the, the, the sum over all these uh, differs from the, the exact result for, that we want to find for spins and likewise for magnetic susceptibilities. So yeah, this, this spin representation, um, unless it yeah, fails to, in the, if you treat it in the canonical ensemble, it fails to reproduce finite temperature observables. There's just one way out, and that's, that, um, that is based on the observation that the ground state sits in the right in the d equal plus one subspace, and you can understand this, or this, this is also the case for, for more generic spin systems because the, these d equal plus one subspace cannot uh, um, benefit from yeah, lowering the energy in the Hamiltonian since the spin operator takes on the value of zero there. So for gener generic spin systems, as long as we work at zero temperature, we can assume that the system, the ground state is in the d equal plus one subs subspace and we can continue with our fermionic spin representation. And that is the idea that is behind the zero temperature formul formulation of the pseudo fermion functional RG, so in some sense fancy diagrammatics. I will briefly explain how this works. So you, this is the spin representation. We rewrite the spin Hamiltonian in, in, in terms of fermions, and then we deform the action in a sense that we have with a deformation parameter lambda that we have a simple starting point when lambda is infinity, and then we um, derive flow equations that take us from lambda to infinity to lambda equals zero, where we recover the full physical theory. And in, in this, there are several choices for this, this deformation or cutoff procedure, but what we want to do here is to modify the bare propagator, which is just one over I omega, since the system has no kinetic energy in terms of the F fermions, by a cutoff such that we, one after the other, switch on my, uh, Matsubara frequencies going from high frequencies to low frequencies, and at the end we have all frequencies together. So then the, the flow, or how the, the, how the system um, changes or the correlation function changes from the simple starting point to the back to the physical theory is given in terms of flow equations that are written down here for these gray boxes. The gray boxes um, represent vertex functions and for the non-experts this is the essentially um, F, um, an, an F fermion correlator, what we are seeing here, two-point correlators and four-point correlators. This is an exact rewriting of the many-body problem However, we have to truncate. Yeah, there would be a flow equation for the six-point vertex that appears here, and we usually set the six-point vertex to zero just to be able to um, solve this set of flow equations numerically. And um, of course, we introduce approximations in that in that way. So, if um, if we do that, um, what are the observables? The observables are spin susceptibilities that are related to this four-point Fermi vertex. Um, on the Matsubara axis, so we have access to magnetic phase diagrams. And the benefits of this method, although that might seem quite complicated, are numerous, so you can apply it for, for any type of lattice, so it's oblivious to frustration in the lattice. You can apply it for any long-range spin-spin interactions. High dimensionality is not a problem, and you can, or my colleagues have even shown that you can go beyond Heisenberg interactions, Gerlichinsky, Moria, or gamma terms are possible. So here is a here is a use case um, by Iqbal et al. where they studied the J1 J2 pyrochlor lattice. Uh, so that, that's a complicated three-dimensional lattice with the J1 and J2 being two coupling constants. And they figure, for example, here they figure out that you get a paramagnetic phase and various new um, um, 
magnetic uh, ordered phases depending on J1 and J2 using that method, and you can also get static spin structure factors that you can compare to exp experiments. Good, but so this is for t equals zero, and now I want to ask the question, what happens if you're interested in t larger than zero, finite temperature, as is usually the case in experiments, yeah? Then one, one remark for the, for the experts, there is a way to project onto the d equal plus one subspace that goes by the name popov fedotov projection and uses an imaginary chemical potential um, that might sound strange, and it is really hard to implement in to input this into the functional RG and has not been achieved so far, but this is like the, the background of our system method, the diagrammatic Monte Carlo. But say I want, don't want to do that, I want to choose a simpler way. So is there maybe a fermionic spin representation that is always faithful, and if yes, can we use it to do diagrammatics with it? And the answer is yes. Um, the answer is shown here, one spin and you represent that in terms of three Majorana fermions. So don't be confused. This is not the famous Kitaev Majorana representation that was used first to solve the Kitaev model. And this is a representation that goes back to Zwielig and Martin. Here is the representation. So each spin is uh, represented in terms of two Majoranas. What are Majoranas? If you're not familiar with them, here is the Majorana 101. You can think about it as half a complex fermion. So if you have one complex fermion, now called C, you can form two, complex, two uh, linear combinations and you get Hermitian objects out, one, uh, one Majorana and another Majorana that fulfill still the fermionic anti-commutation relations. And if you dagger that, yeah, you, you get back to itself, as you can see from the definition. And if you use these rules, and you put these, these, uh, this prescription here in the spin algebra, you can check that this is always fulfilled. Yeah? No unphysical, Hilbert, no unphysical um, energies appear in the spectrum. The representation is always faithful. And one word about uh, dimensionality of Hilbert spaces. So a single Majorana has dimension, uh, Hilbert space Major dimension square root of two. It's three Majoranas per spin, so you take it to the third power. You consider n a system made of n spins. So this gives you this Hilbert space dimension for the Majoranas. If you rewrite that, you find the two to the power n that you expect for spin one half, but an additional factor of two to the n half. And as we said, there are no unphysical energies. This must go into artificial degeneracies. But we know that they are there, and we can take care about them in our numerical method. So that, that is not a problem. Okay, so um, now we need to do the diagrammatics for pseudo-Majoranas, the Hamiltonians that we have to deal with when we put our eta times eta for each spin in are purely interacting yeah, for Majorana Hamiltonians. Um, and we can, of course, um, rederive the functional RG flow equations for this Majorana Hamiltonians, again using a Matsubara frequency cutoff. And these flow equations look very similar to the complex fermionic flow equations. It's a bit, even a bit simpler because yeah, the, there are no arrows associated to the, to, to, to the lines, to the propagator lines, because we, are, we do not distinguish between Majorana creation and annihilation operators. Good, so the second approach that we want to um, pursue is some yeah, quite, quite involved um, Non, no, or another non-perturbative diagrammatic approach called the parquet approach. Here we don't have to choose a, a cutoff procedure like for the, Matsura, uh, for the, for the um, FRG, and in some sense this can be seen as the limit of the multi-loop FRG for the experts. This is something that uh, Fabian Kugler and Jan van Delft have explored recently. So the, these, um, the parquet approach um, the, it consists of two main equations. This is the Schwinger-Dyson equation, which gives you an exact relation between the, between the self-energy and the vertex. This is the bare vertex that is just the Jij. Um, and the second equation for the vertex that is now not an exact equation, but involves some approximation. And the approximation is that the vertex consists of the bare vertex and then all types of diagrams that you can cut in two um, by cutting two propagator lines. Yeah? So you can separate Two, um, two, of, two and two of these external legs by cutting somewhere internally two propagator lines and um, you can solve some set of self-consistency equation to achieve that vertex. Good. So let's see how, how this new proposed method works for a very simple system, the Heisenberg dimer again. 
And now you might scratch your head and say, well, the Heisenberg dimer, isn't that a bit too simple? Yes, it's very, a very simple system, very small Hilbert space, and the analytic solution can be obtained in two lines. But for the, these diagrammatic methods, it's as complicated as a huge, say, pyroclaw lattice, because all the frequencies are there, all the, all the diagrams are there. It's just that the lattice is a bit, uh, is a bit different. So it's, the ex it's an excellent benchmarking case for our new di diagrammatic methods. So here are the results. This is, um, I choose to look at the magnetic susceptibilities, of one the local one and the non-local one over, over two decades of, of, of temperature measured in units of, of J. J is always set to one. And we find this, the gray is the exact solution and we find that we get good agreement with the exact solution down to about 30% uh, uh, of J for the susceptibilities. And what is quite surprising is that the, uh, the FRG blue dots performs um, not worse um, than the par this more involved parquet approximation. And that is surprising because the parquet approximation, the, num the, the order of the diagrams that you miss in the diagrammatic, the diagrammatic expansion of the, of the gamma, the first missing diagram in the parquet appears at order j to the four, whereas in the one loop FRG, it appears to the order uh, j cubed. So, but still, this doesn't seem to help in the, in the strong coupling or low, low temperature limit. Yeah. Good, so, but let me repeat, this is still, still a non-perturbative method in the sense that some diagram types appear in infinite order. Others are missing, like, like the ones that um, lead to this estimate. Okay, this is the, the Heisenberg dimer. Now let's go to some more serious system, um, the pyrochlor. Uh, cis pyrochlor lattice with the Heisenberg antifermagnetic put on it. So a pyrochlor lattice is a lattice of corner sharing tetrahedra in 3D. The spin sits on, uh, spin sit on the corner of the tetrahedra, and this is highly frustrated. So there is no exact benchmark like in the Heisenberg, uh, like in the uh, Dimer case. And it's also a quantum spin liquid candidate until recently, at least, because then it was found that in zero temperature that there might be um, spatial symmetry breaking in Dimer order. Good, here are our results for the, for the um, pyrochlor lattice. Now I plot the uniform susceptibility. That would be something that you measure in experiment over temperature. And I compare the one loop FRG results against established methods. Uh, one is the high temperature series expansion that breaks down around say 0 0.7, even though we already take the Padé approximant here. You can do uh, DMRG on, on a cluster of 48 sites, and here the authors say, oh, this is again only down to 0.7. I think the um, gold standard method for this type of system is the diagrammatic Monte Carlo, which is perturbation theory, but not resummed up to some very high order. And this is this gray, grayish region, and we find that our results um, compete very well with this diagrammatic uh, Monte Carlo results. So, as a the bottom line here, I think we can say that the Pseudo-Majorana FRG is, com is competitive in performance down to about 0.2 um, J in temperature for that lattice. So um, can we do something that the um, diagrammatic Monte Carlo people cannot do? And this is, this is now um, the question about phase transitions. And for a benchmark system for magnetic phase transitions, let us look at the cubic lattice anti magnet um, as is shown here, for now just with nearest neighbor coupling, only J1 antiferromagnetic coupling. And then it's known it's a three-dimensional system with a continuous uh, spin rotation symmetry that below a, critical, a finite critical temperature, we should expect to see magnetic nail order as it's shown here. And the way to yeah, assess this critical temperature is usually finite size scaling, and we can do this in our Majorana FRG as well, except that we do not really simulate systems that are, that are finite. Um, we simulate infinite systems, translational invariant systems, and this is also one of the strengths of the method, uh, saving us a lot of numerical work. So we just use a reference site, and the finite size is incorporated in our simulation by defining a correlation ball. So only the, the, the sites within this gray, within this gray ball are, have non-trivial correlations to the reference site, meaning they, they, there exist non-trivial vertices for, for these correlations. Um, so this defines a size L, and we can do finite size scaling of the um, correlation length over, over L, and this is this plot uh, shown down here, and we, we see a nice crossing point um, around uh, 0.92, 
temperature of 9.92, and now we can check what, yeah, what's the established Monte Carlo result, exact error control Monte Carlo result for this lattice as it's a non-frustrated lattice, and this sits only 3% away at 0.946. Uh, this is the gray line. Okay, very good. So we, we have pinpointed the, the, the critical temperature quite exactly. Now what about the critical properties, the, the, um, the critical exponents? So we can attempt a scaling collapse of the plot using the well-known classical univer universal critical exponent of the 3D Heisenberg universality class 0.71 and the dots here show the almost perfect collapse. And this is, um, this is especially like, interesting because sometimes the FRG is criticized to be um, essentially mean field theory. Um, so we can refute this criticism here because the collapse for the mean field critical exponents here, 0.5, looks considerably worse. So we seem to capture yeah, the, the, this non-trivial universality at the phase transition. Now let's leave um, Monte, quantum Monte Carlo behind by switching on a J2, so a next nearest K neighbor uh, coupling in this, in this lattice. And this frustrates the lattice, so Monte Carlo is out of the game. And we can, so we can still use our method, the, the, the FRG, to uh, follow the critical temperature with increasing J2 and see how it drops uh, quite drastically. Um, see, uh, previous numerics have apparently underestimated the quite drastic drop of this um, of the critical temperature when you when you add J2. So this opens the question: Is there maybe a larger um, paramagnetic ground state region in this in the system than was that was anticipated before? Okay, so um, let me give you one of the, uh, a short outlook. So what else can we do with the method? Um, this is titled towards pseudo-Majorana FRG for Rydberg arrays. In Rydberg arrays that are quite popular nowadays in the cold atoms community, we are facing the problem of a very different Hamiltonian, not Heisenberg, but transverse field easing model with, with an additional longitudinal field, which is also long-range interacting. And yeah, the first DMRG studies came up with a very involved phase diagram for a two-dimensional square lattice of this, this, this Rydberg atoms, where very soon you start getting enormous unit cell sizes. So this rhombic order, for, for example, you can see this is a DMRG calculation on a 15 times 80 um, 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 cell, and the unit cell is all, almost half as big as, this, as the simulation cell. And this, then you might scratch your head and say, well, this, um, should I trust the simulations? Because yeah, I, I fear I have commensurability problems here, and we think yeah, this, is a, this is a fair critique. And we hope to yeah, um, counter that with, with the FRG, which works in the thermodynamic limit from the start. And also, um, it might be useful. So it's not, I think, not established what's the temperature. Is there a temperature in experiments with Rydberg atoms? But it would be nice to also learn about the finite temperature axis in this, in this phase diagram. So this is why, together with my PhD student, Benedict, who presented a poster on this, we are setting up another Majorana approach to these uh, spin Hamiltonians, now based on the famous Kitaev Majorana representation. This is um, from the shelf. This is not a faithful representation. Yeah, it has these unphysical energies, but for the transverse field easing model, it turns out where a single Pauli matrix is missing, it's faithful again. So, and it also has some built in time reversal symmetry and some unphysical time reversal symmetry that we can nevertheless put to good use in our, in our numerics. And here are some first results for benchmark systems. So, again, a dimer where we, where we find very favorable agreement with exact results, or the transverse field easing model on a 2D square lattice where we find definitely the correct. Uh, correct um, type of order as expected, and the critical temperature in that case is 20% off. Um, that is kind of expected because we know that the lower the temperature, the higher order of vertices are relevant in an RG, in an RG sense. Okay, so final slide. Um, another outlook, what can we do towards stronger coupling, meaning getting to lower temperatures, even below this 30 or 20% of J. And certainly what we need to do is to make better use of, of, our, of our vertex. So we are, from a practical point of view, we are limited to the four-point vertex with four legs. Yeah, the six-point vertex is almost impossible to store or to calculate on computers. So we, are, we have to go with a four-point vertex, and currently we are very, like, um, we, we are very um, much 
throwing away information because each leg corresponds to one fermionic uh, degree of freedom, either complex fermion or Majorana fermion in the Majorana FRG, and you have to combine two fermions to get one spin. So the four-point vertex carries the information of a spin-spin correlator so far. So what if the four-point vertex each leg could be associated with a single spin operator. And this is indeed possible. It has been explored recently uh, by Peter Kopitz and colleagues who figured out that you do not need um, an unconstrained fermionic path integral um, to apply the FRG. And that is, of course, exciting because now with only using four-point vertices, I can study, I, I have four-point spin correlators in my theory. And this means yeah, I can probably go to lower temperatures. Another um, nice feature here is that, yeah, as spin-spin correlators gave you access to magnetic susceptibilities, we of course have that here in the in the Kopitz FRG as well, but we have also the four-point correlators which give us access to the susceptibility of valence-bond solids. So we we are we are suddenly in a situation to distinguish, yeah, these this type of paramagnetic paramagnet to this type of paramagnet. Other features are here that we can use finite uh, arbitrary um, spin length S and the cutoff procedure is a bit more physical in the sense that now there is a cutoff in terms of the J of the spin-spin coupling and this, the full spin algebra is um, encapsulated in the initial condition that are derived for free, spin, for free spins. Okay, so this is work that I explore with my master student, Samira Hatoum, and here is some very first um, fresh from the CPU results on the, on the ridiculously simple fermentic easing dimer, which is only, it's, uh, where we, which, is a, which is a classical system. We, can, we only looked at static properties so far, but yeah, we can see that the method works, and the more vertices we include, the closer we get to the exact results, which are the dashed um, for this correlation function, and the exact results are the dashed lines. With that, um, let me summarize. So with the Pseudo-Majorana FRG slash Parquet approach for spin one half, I presented a new tool for quantum magnets. We think that's a versatile tool that can, that is in some sense complementary to the established Pseudo-Fermion Pseudo FRG as it can be now applied for finite temperatures, whereas the Pseudo-Fermion FRG works only at zero temperature. It's a flexible tool, so it works in any dimension. It works for any lattice frustrated or not. Um, it works for any coupling range. This is interesting in terms of uh, what I said about Rydberg atoms, which have long range, tail, long range tails and also dipolar interactions. It's, it also can be extended to work for any coupling type, Jolichinsky, Moria, or gamma terms, or even retarded couplings. So that's, that's interesting if you're asking, what do the phonons do to my spin liquids? Yeah, do they possibly destroy the spin liquids at some low temperature? And it, it can be extended to magnetic fields. So it's a quantitative method. Yeah, it's, it really outputs susceptibilities and thermodynamics that can be ex ex compared to experiments. And yeah, we also showed that it's quantitative in the sense for magnetic phase transition that you can um, get the critical temperatures, you can get the phase diagrams, and even the critical exponents right. With that, thanks goes to my collaborators on that project, and thanks to you for listening. Thank you for this nice presentation. Are there questions from the audience? Okay, so then let me start with uh, the questions. Um, so, have you tried to compare that to you know exactly soluble models which exist, um, for example, also for the full temperature dependence of 2D, 3D Kitaev models, for example? Yeah, for the Kitaev model, um, you need to generalize to this easing type interactions that you find in the Kitaev model, and this is, this is work in progress. We have not done that. So far, the, um, results exist only for Heisenberg systems. Oh, okay. So, yeah. okay. This is for If you know Heisenberg. exactly solvable Heisenberg model in 2D or 3D, let me know. <laughs> well, only for the ground states, but not for yeah. the excited states. Yeah. Okay. Um, other questions? Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I'm not uh, an expert in this field, but I'm interested. Um, you said that with the Majorana spins, you get a dimension square root of two per spin. How can I imagine a dimension square root of two? 
So per spin you get you get this square root of two to the power of three. So it's it's kind of for 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 a spin it would be would be dimension two, and now you have a factor of square root two above. That just tells you it's it's necessary to either take a Majorana from another spin or take one Majorana from uh, outer space together to get a complete fermionic Hilbert space. Yeah. Okay, so you have end up with integer numbers. Yeah, you have to end up with integer number of Majoranas too. Like if I you want to put it in, write it a matrix Hamiltonian with it, you have to add another Majorana. So maybe a quick follow-up to this one, because normally in analytical calculation, you would then pair up basically um, these dangling Majoranas to, to actually fix one of the sectors to get rid of the degeneracy. And do you do something similar, or do you actually keep the full degeneracy and just, uh, you know... Yeah, it's essential that, it that we... Right, this, this pairing means... This, this has to be a non-local pairing, right? So, so that means you have, if say, if you study a square system, a square lattice system, you have to make a choice how you want to do your pairing, vertically or, or, or horizontally. And that, we think, if, if, the sys, if, if the method would work exactly, that shouldn't matter. But as if, uh, since our method has this uh, truncation, we do, a perturba uh, we, we, we do an approximation, we very strongly feel that we should avoid that to not bias the system in, in, a, like in, a, in a geometric way. Yeah, so we, we, we do not um, fix this parities, although we could do that. In principle, one could do that. Another reason is that we want to avoid dealing with Majorana hoppings. This would lead to a hopping of Majoranas, and that would make um, our numerics way, way, way more complicated. Yeah. Okay, okay, because normally you would break the symmetry projectively only, but you're saying that since this is not, not Im uh, implemented exactly, that right. you, you want to avoid that. Yeah. Okay, good. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, then, yeah, let's thank the speaker again.